Hello everybody, how are you doing today? And welcome back to my little D&D talk. My name, of course, is Trevor Slescu. I am the owner of Monster Hobbies in High River, Alberta, Canada. Okay, that's kind of goofy. But anyway, today we are going to be taking a look at one of my favorite things, of course, in our original 1979 Advanced Dungeons and Dragons DM guide. And that is figures. It figures, of course. No, I like figures. I like the miniatures. And there is a lot of really cool ones tonight in the video. And I'm also going to give you a bit of an understanding on how these little figures work on grid maps, because that's another major key in playing Advanced Dungeons and Dragons from 1979, first edition. And what's really nice about this is that there are a lot of people that are going back to the original first edition just to see what it was all about and to try to enjoy the fun of how we had it back in my day. Because back in the 80s, I used to go over to my neighbor's house and we would play Dungeons and Dragons quite a bit. Now, I like reading this now that I'm <laughs> 46 and I'm an old man. No, anyway, <laughs> I got old. <laughs> all right, enough joking. But, um... Yeah, because when we were kids, you know, this was pretty popular in, like, I was in junior high school. And uh, some of my friends were also playing D&D, playing D&D, because I don't think we fully got the rules and all that, because we were about, like, grade 8, <laughs> you know, at lunchtime of grade 8, you know. Hurry up, you're rolling the dice, oh, yeah, beep, next bell, you gotta get back to eating, or getting back to classes, oh, you know, this kind of thing. And, um, yeah. Like, I had a neighbor next door, and on the weekends we'd go in his basement and play Dungeons & Dragons. He had a big table down there, and a Vex Trek, and a bunch of cool old video game consoles. Yeah, ColecoVision, all this kind of stuff. But D&D, &D, we would play that, and then his dad would come down and watch TV, kick us all out, listen to country music. <laughs> yeah, good old times. But yeah, we, we explored the dungeons and all that stuff, but I don't think we were actually doing the rules right. And a lot of things did not make sense, like percentiles and everything that Gary is going on about. So anyway, yeah, it was quite fun time. So that's what I'm trying to do now is I'm reading this through and getting an understanding, and I'm going to try to give that to you. So without further ado, we came here to see figures, not me talking. And there's some really cool ones in this video too, some right out of England that are based right on the sketches out of the original 1979 Monster Manual. So we will check that out and many more things. So without further ado, <sighs> a lot of rambling, let's check out this video. Now to understand Advanced Dungeons and Dragons back in 1979, we have to realize that there wasn't very many figures specifically made for the game at this stage. There were a few companies out there, like Ral Partha, which made some pretty amazing metal figures, as well as a few other companies. But overall, these figures were pretty random and didn't really match the artwork and whatnot of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons in the Monster Manuals. However, there were still some figures around, but because there weren't very many, and maybe hobby shops didn't carry Ral Partha, or, you know, not many did at the time, or all the rest, Gary Gygax does have a way around this here. So this is his take on what was going on with figures then. But as we know now, you can get amazing Dungeons & Dragons figures. You can even get ones that are made in England that actually look like the actual original Monster Manual guys, which is pretty cool. So here is Gary's 1979 look at this. So it says, Use of miniature figures with the game. The special figures cast for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons add color to play and make re refereeing far easier. Each player might be required to furnish painted figures representing his or her player character and all henchmen and or hirelings included in the game session. Such distinctively painted figures enable you to immediately recognize each individual involved. Figures can be placed so as to show their order of march, i.e. 
which characters are in the lead, which are in the middle, and which are bringing up the rear. Furthermore, players are more readily available are readily able to visualize their array and plan actions while seeing the reason for your restrictions on their actions. Monster figures are likewise most helpful as many things become instantly apparent when a party is arrayed and their monster opponents placed. Furnishing such monsters is probably best undertaken as a joint effort, the whole group contributing toward the purchase of such figurines on a regular basis. Be very careful to purchase castings which are in scale. Out-of-scale monsters are virtually worthless in many cases, like if they're too small or too big. As a rule of thumb, HO scale is 25 millimeters equals one actual inch, which equals six feet in scale height or length or breadth. Now, the reason why Gary Gygax is suggesting HO scale is because there was a vast array of figures in HO scale, now, HO scale comes from O scale, which was used in model trains, like your Line L trains and those big ones, the three rail train sets of the past. O scale is 148th scale, and HO scale is half of 148th or 187th scale. However, over in England, they use double O scale, which is supposed to be O, like similar to HO. However, their measurement is 172nd scale, which of course is the scale that is used as well as 176th in military models. So getting back to this, HO scale is equal to 25 millimeters, which is also equal to an actual inch. Now in scale, an inch in HO scale is equal to six feet. So that is how it is worked out. Now, what's nice about using HO scale, even today, is that there are a lot of companies that make things in HO scale, like houses, buildings, and whatnot, and 172nd scale for military. And they cover all aspects of history, as well as there are some fantasy figures out there, which we'll take a look at. Here are some nice 172nd scale figures that uh, Caesar Miniatures puts out, which are amazing for these adventures and for the tiles and whatnot that we need for this scale. Now, 172nd scale is not quite HO scale because HO scale is half O, which is a model railroad scale of 148th scale. Now, HO is 187th to be accurate. However, 172nd is equivalent to the British double O range, which is their equivalent of uh, half O. So there is a little bit of a difference in here with the model train and military world. However, these will work in the same way. So here we have a nice set of adventurers and it says, Hero, can you beat the evil forces? Down here we have dwarves. Dwarf, dwarf axes are ready. And here we have elves. Noble race fight for you. <laughs> These must be uh, like Russian elves, eh? <laughs> In Russia, elf fight you! Anyway, then over here we have a box of the undead, and it says, For the Lich King, goblins, you could resist goblins no longer. And then orc warriors, the time of the orc is coming. And these are pretty nice because, like, with these adventures, you get 15 figures and four random figures. And a great big monster in here, too. That's why this box is taller. With the dwarfs, you get 35 plus figures. The elves, 35 plus. The undead, 35 plus. The goblins, 35 plus, And 35 plus with the orcs. So what we're going to do is I'm going to search through these boxes and try to find some monsters for us. Now, there are a lot of other figures that you could use as well in 172nd scale. In fact, they're pretty much limitless. Historical figures from war games like these Roman Imperial Legionnaires by Zevsta. This is a pretty cool box because they actually will form up the tortoise with the shields and all of that. And I'm just trying to see how many you get in here. It doesn't really say on the front of the box. I think there's 48. Usually in 172nd scale, they stuff between 35 and 50 figures in a box, just depending. Here we have Vlad Tapish, Dracul the Impaler, 
There's 42 figures in here. And they give you all the historical Vlad Tapish figures, as well as a not-so-historical Bram Stoker vampire. Uh, these, again, are 72nd scale, and they are done by... Uh, I think it's Toy Soldier. I can't quite remember. But here we have Hat. And Hat makes all kinds of historical figures, going back to biblical times as well. These are Alexander's Thracians. These were the guys that were... Um, not quite in Romania, but a little further south back in the day. Uh, Present-day Romania. They were further south, more toward Greece. But again, these guys could be like barbarians. There's Saxons, you can get Vikings, all kinds of things. Now, these guys might be um, uh, more useful in the book when we get into talking about like hirelings and all that sort of thing. Because you can actually hire uh, soldiers in the original AD&D. So we'll get back into actually building a, a simple map for these guys in just a moment. Continuing with Gary's thoughts on figures, he says here that figure bases are necessarily broad in order to assure that the figures will stand in the proper position and not constantly be falling over. So here I have one of the figures from Caesar Miniatures, and what I've done is I've glued him onto a poker chip, a circular poker chip. And this will ensure, of course, that he won't fall over. Okay, so Gary continues, because of this, it is usually necessary to use a ground scale twice that of the actual scale for HO, and squares of about one actual inch per side are suggested. Each ground scale inch can then be used to equal three and a third linear feet. So a 10 foot wide scale corridor is three actual inches in width and shown as three separate squares. This allows depiction of the typical array of three figures abreast and also enables easy handling of such figures when they are moved. While you may not find it convenient to actually use such figures and floor plans to handle routine dungeon movement, having sheets of squares for encounter area depiction will probably be quite helpful. If you do so, be certain to remember that ground scale differs from figure scale, and when dealing with length, two man-sized figures per square is quite possible, as the space is actually six scale feet with respect to length. This is meaningful when attacking a snake, dragon, etc. If characters are able to attack the creature's body length. Okay, just gotta move this. <laughs> With respect to basically bipedal erect opponents, scale will not be a factor. Details of preparation and painting of miniature figures for the game are not germane to this work. Your hobby supplier will have an assortment of small brushes and paints for such purposes, and you may inquire there as to the best techniques of painting, which I can show you at Monster Hobbies. Now, we want to play with our figures in Advanced Dungeons and & Dragons, and to be able to do that, we're going to need to have some kind of mat, which of course is all squares. Now, you can find many different um, things out there that have the squares on them, printed and ready for you. But if you want to use something really easy, here we have some wrapping paper, Charlie Brown style. But if we open it up inside, you can see, maybe you can't see, I don't know. <laughs> there is a nice little grid in here, and these squares actually add up to one inch one inch, one inch. So in that way we can build any of our mazes or whatever we need using the back of Christmas paper. And it is fairly cheap and easy to use. You could also transfer these lines onto styrofoam or something if you want to get a little more permanent, which I think I might actually do, and uh, keep them around in the store and maybe run a simple campaign using that. So what does this look like when we're using our scale? Well, I'll show you in a sec here. So according to the book, the way that Gary has this arranged is that each square, being one inch by one inch square, is actually equal to three and a third feet in the game scale. So one full square is three and a third feet. Two squares are going to equal six and two thirds. And then the full three squares is equal to ten feet. 
And as he says, you should be able to get three figures abreast in here. Or if they go into this tighter corridor, you'll only get two in there. And if it's just a single tight passageway, you're going to get one character in these squares. So this is the scale that Gary recommends when you're going to design your uh, tabletop battle here to actually fit figures. Now as you read through the Dungeon Master Guide, you'll find that some things like spells and bow and arrow and weapons will have different range values. Some of them will be firing in inches and others will be moving in feet. So Gary kind of bounces back and forth between the two, but I understand the reasoning. Because some of these things, if they were all done in one, one measurement, then you would have sort of weird spots where, oops, where something would fall off sort of short in between squares. So for example, here I have a wizard, and she's going to be here. And let's say she needed to cast a spell on a guy over here. Now she has a 7 inch distance for whatever the spell is, as an example. So when they cast a spell, anybody within 7 squares, because each square is an inch, would be hit. So, if, so her maximum range is from here to this X right here on target, if she's standing in this square. Now, if this guy was here, it would be shot at long range, and maybe the effect wouldn't be so bad. But if he's in here, it might be worse for him. But it still counts as this range. Now, somebody like an archer, who has a bow and arrow, could shoot at a 30-foot range. So, from X, which is here, this archer can fire his bow and it will land an arrow at this length at 30 feet. Now the reason for this is, of course, because if it was a different value in here, he would be shooting and ending up somewhere in here. So Gary's used both scales just to sort of give you a representation of where this is. See, for example here, is a 7 inch distance from where the person was standing to where the, it's going to land. So if you're going to put this into feet, it would be something bizarre like 13 and a third in scale non-gridded measurement value. So if you were not using a gridded map, if you were doing this in just an open rectangle and you're trying to fire, you would need to measure 13 and a third, you know, inches. Or, you know, use this weird measurement. So instead of that, Gary just says, okay, use seven here. But on here, you're going to use 30 feet. So again, we go back to this theory of three squares equals 10 feet. So one, two, three, it's 10 feet. One, two, three, another 10 feet. And one, two, three, the third 10 foot out there for that 30 foot range. Now there's other area effects spells and other items that work in a different way. So what we have here, oh, let's use our spellcaster again. Um, she's going to cast this area effect circle spell. So she's standing back here a little off camera. And it's basically... Actually, what I've used here is a net. So this net opens up into a 10-foot square. So again, according to Gary's measurements, 1, 2, 3 by 1, 2, 3 makes us a box 10-inch square. So our sorceress here is throwing a net for whatever weird reason, but let's just say she's doing that. So it's from 20 feet away. So we're going from the center of this square and the center of the net's gonna land there. So according to this, it should be, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six squares away using the three squares equals 10 feet. And then the net opens up and it comes out and touches all the corners, entrapping whoever's inside. So again, you can see how the area effect works in the squares, as well as distances and measurements from all these squares. That's why it's convenient to use the gridded map. And of course, it's cheap and easy to use our 
wrapping paper from Christmas. So remember to keep all this stuff left over from last Christmas and whatnot, or just go out and find some new wrapping paper. Maybe you don't want Charlie Brown back here. <laughs> so anyway, this is all how this works. So now we're just going to get into a little bit of a build. So here I have this nice old vintage dungeon magazine, and I got a bunch of these for sale at the store. I'm going to put them online in the future here. Anyway, this magazine is the September-October 1998 edition of Dungeon. And it says here, Free Dungeons & Dragons Fast Play Game Inside. So that's really cool. Now, this is second edition AD&D, or D&D, maybe at that point. But at any rate, here it is inside the magazine. Now, this is a really good fast play thing, and I'm thinking of uh, building some of the stuff in here and using it at Monster Hobbies just to get people in. Now, I know 5th edition and all that's going to be different, but this just gives people a gist of the idea of it, and it's very simple and very easy to play. So, of course, it's a 16-page issue in here, written by a bunch of cool people, and it, it goes through and it gives you all this stuff, tells you about the funky dice, the D4s, D6s, D8s, you know, basically all these geometrical shapes dice and everything that you use to play D&D, &D, and the little triangular one you hope to never step on in bare feet. Okay, but anyway, it tells you what they all do. They also say if you only have D6, here's how you can make it all work, which is yeah, complicated. Uh, inside, they give you four characters, so you get a f uh, two different fighters, a male and a female. These characters are all at level two. It gives basic stats. Their movement, which again, remember, is in those squares, 12 inch. Uh, 12 inch movement for them. And then here you get a halfling and you get a human wizard. So there's really three humans, one halfling. And then the halfling moves six, six inches and the wizard will move at 12. So again, going back to our Charlie Brown Christmas paper here. These guys can, the halfling can move six inches, so... If he's here, he can go one, two, three, four, five, six in a round of combat, or yeah, a round, a turn, whatever, for movement. Move six inches. The wizard can go 12, which is quite a long way on this piece of paper. Maybe too long for this piece of paper. At any rate, so it's got all these things about, you know, what, how to play the game, uh, what you're supposed to read in the little square boxes and all this sort of thing. But here's what I want to make. Now this, of course, if you're not a DM, you can't see this, but <laughs> no, at any rate, I don't think it'll matter. Um, hmm, I seem to have lost my... Oh, there it is. Okay, so what we have here is the map of the Ruined Tower, which is this little episode of Fast Play D&D. So here we have a scale saying one square equals ten inches. Now this is on this map. Sorry, 10 feet. This is on this map here. But remember, 10 feet, again, is equal to three squares on our grid. So one, two, three. There's 10 feet right there. You know? So, now if you count this up, in this first little section here, we have one, two, three, four squares by, of course, one, two, three, four. So when we're using three squares on our grid, this now becomes three times four, which equals 12 by 12. So on our Charlie Brown paper, we're going to count out 12, and we're going to count out 12. Then we can cut this thing out and make it into a box. Now this small piece of paper I got here will actually do the scriptorium right here, because it's three by three, which on here, of course, 10 feet, so 10, 20, 30 feet, is going to, of course, equal one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine squares by nine squares. So I'll have enough on that paper to build this little bit, and I've got some more wrapping paper to build this, the hallway, okay, the ruined tower, the hallway, than the library. I don't have enough for the secret tunnel, but I've read through this thing and it's really uh, the creature gets out of here and if 
you can, you know, catch him, whatever. So this will be my kind of raw play. It's not going to be too very important. However, the rest of this is because when we get into combat, we're going to need to move our figures around, hide behind the little ruined bits and all this stuff, you know, have the door here. So you, uh, you could actually transfer this onto a styrofoam after cutting out the squares over there. And then you could build styrofoam walls. One, two, three, four. Glue a little door in here. You you know, to make this into a 3D object that you can play in. And because this is a ruined tower, you can build the walls up a certain height and then break them at the tops and all this stuff. You know, just to make it so that you can see what you're doing with the figures and still give off the impression that this is a broken tower. Hallway, you can put a couple of runners along the side of your styrofoam. All kinds of cool stuff. So what I'll do is I'll cut out some of these squares and just sort of show you on the gridded paper what this would look like. So what I'll do here is I'll take my ruler. Now I do have a longer ruler than this, but this is all I can find right at the second here. And I can easily line that ruler up with the dots. And then I can take my knife here, extend the killer blade, and then on a wooden cutting board, because I'm not going to cut into my fabric under here, I can just go right across there to where I need, and then pull the paper off and keep the part that I want over here. So, like I said before, I'll do that off camera, and then we can peg this together. So I've just come back from cutting out our 30 foot by 30 foot scriptorium. This, of course, will be the room. And because this paper is just going to keep coiling up all the time, I thought I should give it a thin cardboard backing. And what I'm using here is the back of a pizza box, because we had pizza just the other day. So recycle, reuse, whatever. That's our uh, motto as model builders. So I've got my old Yoohoo glue stick here. Now this is an old glue stick I have, so I don't know how well it's going to glue anymore. But all you need to do is just take off the cap. Now the pizza box is of course just cut out. What I'm going to do is try to glue good old Charlie Brown and Company down along here. Okay, let's hope this thing works. Now just you know, pretend we're in kindergarten again and do a little glue. So let's see, let's try to be somewhat accurate. Okay. Always move out from the center. So you don't put a wrinkle in it like I just did. <laughs> All right. Okay, come on. Flatten out properly. I can tell this may or may not be working. There we go. We got it kind of glued down. Keep your eyes crossed that this will work. And then what I'll do is I will take my ruler again. Maybe I'll cut a little bit of a perimeter around here. But just, you know, clean it up a little bit with the knife to make sure this thing's all nice and square. There's no little rips happening in the corner. And this will keep our nice little grid all flat. What would be nice to do is take a black sharpie and go around the edge here. Just like how it's supposed to be. And then mark off the doorway would be three squares as well. Ten foot wide doorway. Ten foot. Well, Gary said that a regular door is six feet wide, so ten foot would be a larger door, of course. Okay, so I will, I guess, sharpie in the edge and chop it out a bit and all that stuff and then show you how this looks. Okay, so now I have a few of these mounted on cardboard. And I found out that my box board, I don't have enough, big enough for some of the other tiles, but that's okay for demonstration purposes. So what I've done is I've got this glued on the cardboard with a black sharpie around. I've marked out our doors here and our doors on the end of this corridor here. 
And now if I just turn this a little bit, as you can see, I've made it so that the doors will line up with each other on the grids. So now as we go through the map, we of course can uh, show our players, you know, now their characters have reached the hallway here, sort of thing. Once they get to the other door, then I can add in this thing, you know, once they get through, and then they can go into the new adventure zone. So I'm just going to run a little bit of a scenario here real quick, just so you guys can get an idea. Now our first character here is Ilana. She's a fighter at level 2. The player fills out their name there. She is a human. There's all her ability scores, strength, dexterity, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Her armor, her armor class, which is 3, which is an older system, of course. Um, and all she's got here also tells you certain things like she has three daggers she may fight with one of them or throw up to two per round she cannot throw her daggers if she is in close combat she's carrying a torch and a potion of healing which allows her to heal up and based on sort of the artwork i do have this female figure now she's carrying a shield and a short sword i couldn't find anything else but this is a representation anyway, so not too important. So that's our first character out of the four. Our second character is named Darkblade. He is a fighter, again level two. His ability, strength, dexterity, constitution, wisdom, and charisma, as you can see. He's wearing chainmail. Armor class is a four. Uh, movement is 12. Hit points are 12. You got this wound bar, so if he takes any hits, you can start to add in how many are there. Um, now he is more of a ranged fighter as well as a close combat fighter which most everybody is. He's got a long bow so on the figure here I did find one with a pretty big bow. So again we can use him, the figure as him. He doesn't have any magic spells. When attacking with his bow Darkblade makes two attacks each round he cannot use his bow if he is in close combat. And when attacking with his sword, Darkblade does an additional point of damage. Roll damage and then add a point. So the damage is 1d8, which is this one. So let's say he goes and hits somebody. So here I've got 4 damage. And now that becomes 5 because he gets 1 extra point. And then of course he's carrying a torch, 50 foot of coil of rope and a backpack. So again, I think this figure best represents Darkblade. Our third character is Thaddeus. He is a wizard. All these characters are level 2. There's his ability scores there. He has no armor for he wears robes. He moves 12 inches. Armor class is 10. Um, which on these scales the closer you get to zero, the better your armor class is. It's got six hit points, and uh, he's carrying a quarter staff, and he's got a dagger. Now, if I just move this down a little bit, it says, "Whoops, Th spells." Thaddeus may cast each of these spells once per day, so you have to keep record of time. He's got the magic missile. And he's got the sleep spell. He's carrying a lantern. He's got the magical scroll. Thaddeus has a scroll with a knock spell on it. When he reads the scroll aloud, the spell causes a stuck or, or locked door to automatically open. So the figure that I found here... I know I should read those other two spells, but... This guy looks very much like Gandalf. That's <laughs> so... I will use him to represent Thaddeus, and he's also carrying that staff. So let's meet our final character. Now our final character is named Niles. He is a rogue, which means he can be sneaky. Level 2, there's all his ability scores. He's wearing leather armor. His armor class is 6. He moves 6 inches. He's got 7 hit points. Okay, now unfortunately I couldn't find a figure for this because they don't make any halflings, so that's sort of an issue. Um, abilities. Niles has two daggers. He may fight with one of them or throw up to two per round. 
He cannot throw his daggers if he is in close combat. If Niles attacks a humanoid creature from behind, he hits more easily and doubles his damage roll. He's got a lantern and the thief's tools. Niles may open a locked door or using his tools and... Sorry, Niles may open a locked door using his tools and will succeed on a roll of four or less on 1d10. D10 is this one. It, D10 has a zero on it. So, let's see. On a four, you exceed on a roll of four or less. So he just opened up that door. Now, now like I was saying, I don't have a figure to represent him, so I used a dwarf. And this is totally not right to the character, but this dwarf is carrying a shield and an axe. But anyway, he was the only dwarf I actually had that was glued onto the round base, so I just wanted to use that. So this is Thad Thaddeus, or sorry, Niles, pardon me. So now let's continue on in our little adventure here and see how this all works with the gridded floor tiles. Here we have a long corridor that's part of the game. And when the characters open up the door that's on this end here, actually right there, <laughs> You're supposed to read this. You force the door open and a puff of damp, musty air billows out of the doorway. The dust settles and you are looking down a long corridor leading back into the hillside. The walls and floors are made of finished stone and are stained from water damage. The ceiling is supported by heavy oak beams. The corridor disappears into darkness about 20 feet away. So the characters have now entered into the scene and from the light that's outside beyond the door they can only see 20 feet so that would be one two three there's your ten foot four five six so they can only see up to here at this point so what it says is as a DM now would be a good time for the party members to think about lighting their torches or lanterns. It only takes one torch or lantern to throw enough light to see by, but note that anyone who is carrying a lit torch or lantern has to use one hand to do so, so weapons like bows or other two-handed swords cannot be used. Okay, and then it goes on, right? So these guys light up their torches, and now uh, when at least one character lights a torch or lantern, you read this. You see that a ten-foot wide corridor continues into the hillside. The walls and floor have been heavily damaged by water and the flagstones of the floor are pitched up in places from uneven settling. About 40 feet away, so now that's over here, you see a door right there. <laughs> there seems to be something written on the door, but you're too far away to make out what it says. What are you going to do? Okay, so now this is where that movement thing comes in. So I'm not going to read too much more because there's a bunch of uh, hidden things we're not supposed to know about. Which would be spoilers! So let's say we have Darkblade. It's going to move down this hall. So the movement characteristic is in inches, even though it's not shown here. So he would move 12 inches which equals 12 squares. So from where he's standing, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So he is now right at that door, which is 40 feet away. Now the wizard and, of course, our little halfling, they both have, oh, no, sorry, the wizard has a movement of 12. So in one turn, everybody can move right to that door, except our halfling friend, who has a move of six. So he can only go one, two, three, four, five, six on the first turn, and one, two, three, four, five, six on the second. So now these guys are all sitting down here at the door. Takes the three hu takes the three humans one turn to, to move that far but takes our Niles here, two movements. 
So now they are at this door. So what happens? So now we are all sitting at this door here, and who do we have in our party that might be able to open a door? Well, anybody could open a door, but perhaps this door is locked. So here we have Niles. He is our rogue, and he is carrying the thieves' tools. Niles may open a locked door using his tools, and will succeed on a roll of four or less on 1d10. So we don't know if he uh, the door is locked or not, but Niles wants to try this. So here he rolls his dice, and he gets a seven. So he's not able to open the door. However, according to the magazine, our dungeon master here, it says the rotted door falls apart at the first touch. The wood cascades into a pile of splinters, and the hinges and knob clatter to the floor. On the other side of the doorway is a large square room, about 30 feet on a side. Okay, so what we'll do is we will move this, and we will move this down, and then we can move our next tile to link up here. In fact, I wish I had some more room back here. Well, let's just move our corridor out of the way, just for camera purposes, and put our guys here. And now, what do we have? Dun dun dun! Okay, so this is what we've got. So it says, on the other side of the doorway is a large square room about 30 feet on a side. There is another door directly opposite yours at the far side of the room, so that's here. Uh, the floor in here is more level and dry than the corridor was. So now we've got a dry area in here. The room holds six copy desks and stools. So that's what these dice are. One, two, three, four, five, six, because they don't have a model for tables. Um, I know I should, right? <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Four of the desks are occupied by what look like robed monks, their bodies hunched over. One, two, three, four. One of the monks looks up at you, his hood falling back as he does so. He has no skin or flesh, only a skull with small flickers of red flame burning in the pits of his eye sockets. He raises a bony hand and points at you. As if by silent signal, all the other three monks get off their stools. Their robes fly open, revealing that they are nothing more than animated skeletons. They all carry rusted triangular daggers. They move toward you. Cue the Star Trek fight music. Okay, no, anyway. <laughs> all right, so... And then it gets into all this stuff here. Because the skeletons are magically animated bones, they are less affected by weapons that cut. Swords, arrows, and daggers cause less damage when used against the skeleton. So you don't tell that to the players, of course. There are four skeletons, though only two may attack a particular target. If the characters stand their ground in the doorway, then only the front rank may be attacked. So remember, we've got... Not all of these guys are going to be able to fit in, because the door is only six feet wide, so that means that only two guys can go through it at a time. So we probably don't, might not want the wizard there. You probably want both of the fighters there. Okay, so this is what's happening. So these two guys are out of the room, and the other two are in. Blocking the doorway. Okay, so Dark Blade is right there. He needs an 11 or higher to hit. If he hits with his sword, he does 1d8 damage, then adds 1 point for his high strength. Uh, okay, anyway. If he uses his bow, he can attack twice, even against different skeletons, and do 1d8 damage. And... Elana needs a 12 or higher to hit. If she uses a two-handed sword, she rolls 1d10 to determine how much damage she does. If she uses her dagger, she rolls 1d4 to determine damage. Again, divide the result by two. Anyway. Okay, so... And then it says... Uh, for the skeletons, to hit Darkblade, a skeleton needs a 15 or higher on his dice. This is on a d20. To hit Eliana, the skeleton needs a 16 or higher. Okay, so I'm not going to do a full battle round thing, but what it says in the book 
in the magazine, pardon me, is that um, the, pardon me while I grab two dice, all the enemy models attack second and the heroes attack first. Now, in normal D&D, there would be initiative rolls and all this stuff to actually see who really gets to go first because these guys could be surprised. If you're surprised, you don't get to go in the first round. Um, all this kind of stuff. So we're, we're not going to say that that's what's going on. But what we'll do is we'll use a brown dice for, um, for Eliana, or Elana, sorry. We'll use this brown dice for Elana, and we'll use the dark blue dice for Dark Blade. So what will happen here is uh, Dark Blade's going to fire off two of his arrows, so he needs an 11 or higher to hit. Boink, there's a 16 and a 17. So he's actually going to fire two targets this round, hitting that guy and that guy. So now it says uh, you're doing 1d8 of damage, which is right here. So there's eight on the first skeleton and four on the other. Okay, so... Um, no, I just got to find out how many points the skeletons have. Where did I read that? <laughs> anyway, so that, that is his damage on there. And then Eliana, she needs a 12 or higher to hit. Uh, let's see here. Oh, she can throw two daggers, right? She may fight with one of them. We throw up to two per round. Okay, so she's going to throw the two daggers at these two guys, so... Dagger one, a ten. I do believe that missed. And dagger two is another ten, so she completely missed with her daggers. But anyway, so this is the idea of it all. So now, because she can move twelve inches, Let's say she didn't throw the daggers. Let's say she decided to rush into the room and rush a skeleton. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this room is only so, so big. So she could actually rush up right to a skeleton. You know, and this is how all these different range things work. Like, let's say he had a spell, right? Dark blade, or not a spell, a net. So dark blade has a net. Now, according to what that that was they could throw it 20 feet, up to 20 feet away so 20 feet of course is six squares it's one two three four five six you could throw it out to here and then it'll come in in that rectangle right so he could throw it out here and net these two guys you know basically even throw it uh let's see what's good so could throw it into one two three four five uh, four five one, two, three, one, two, three. So in a square in here, and he could entangle these two skeletons on the edge of the net. There's all sorts of things you can do with all these different uh, items you have and whatnot. But the whole idea of all these squares is to map out where you guys are moving, where the enemy is moving, if the enemy dies. You know, all this kind of cool stuff, where the, the things are in the room. Let's say uh, she decides to duck behind this desk and he's over here on this side of the desk, right? Or maybe it's this kind of situation. So... Uh, now, maybe not in this simple scenario, but in the actual book, this skeleton can attack, and she has no defense here, but she does get a bit of a saving cover from this skeleton because the desk is in between the two of them. All these kind of great factors. So that's why making these maps, using these grids and everything, is a great way to figure out what's going on in combat instead of having nothing and me just saying, oh yes, she's there, because, you know, as a DM, I don't know if these guys just entered the room on their turn, you know, now if Gandalf, no, uh, Th Thaddeus, here, I do believe that's his name, um, if he casts a spell, this could be one of those ones that has the seven inch range. So one, two, three, four, you know, five, six, seven can fire out there. So he could shoot, you know, if Darkblade gets out of the way, he could fire his spell over here and cause the skeleton to like sleep or something. Although I don't think sleep would work on a skeleton, but anyway. And then same with 
the halfling. He could run up here because he moves six. So one, two, three, four, five. And there he is. Now this skeleton here is preoccupied with coming out there. Let's say he moved to square. Let's say he's he's trying to engage with Thaddeus, right? So now he moves here. So you can only do one thing per round. A round is six seconds in actual time. So in his six seconds, uh, Niles moved from the doorway. One, two, three, four, five, six. Got around in behind. Now in his second turn, because he's the skeleton is not facing him, Niles has two daggers. If Niles attacks a humanoid creature from behind, he roll, he hits more easily and doubles his damage roll. So let's say he's successful. A dagger is 1d4, which is the dice you never want to step on, because it's a triangle. And there he goes, into the back of the skeleton. Do you read this one from the bottom? So he did two damage, but because he's behind, it's actually four damage. So now the skeleton has taken four damage. And like Gary Gygax said, with the gridded map, it makes it far easier to tell where everybody is. You can have a little note over here as to which skeleton is what. You could even number them on their bases. Um, and then, you know, you, you have a great, uh, a great way of keeping track of all the combat and everything. So, like I say, this is a great way to do it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that great video on figures. And weren't those ones out of England really cool? I'm going to leave a link to that website down in the doobly-doo because I know that's a good one and maybe many of you will want those figures. I know I do. I want the Roper and I want the Rust Monster and I took a look at the forest creatures and everything else. There's some really cool things. Oh, and that there's a red dragon on there and it's 13 inches long and it costs 200 British pounds, which is about 300 and something Canadian. I think it was 350, 375. But it's cool. <laughs> so one day when I win the lottery and all the rest, I'll get it. Or you could support me on Patreon if you really want me to have the dragon. <laughs> I don't know. I do have a Patreon account. Look for that in the doobly-doo. Now, if any of you have any questions about figures or whatnot, please let me know in the blah blah. And anyway, next week we're going to take a look at the DM guide again. And they're talking about creating characters. So this would be kind of interesting because... In 1979, they did have a player's handbook and the DM guide, but like unlike 5th edition now, right? In the player's handbook, in 5th, everything there, uh, you can make your own character out of that. But back in 79, Gary Gygax specifically said that he wanted to have some stuff that the player could make on his character, but the rest would be in here so that the player would have to consult the DM and say, please DM, can I have blankety blank for my character? So it's quite a different sort of headspace on character creation, and I hope you will join us next week. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Destroy that thumbs up button and tell me that you like me by destroying it. <laughs> but yeah, do that because then my videos will rank up from level one to level two. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell because you don't want to miss our future videos and examination of the DM Guide from 1979. So until next time, everybody, happy adventuring. <laughs>